office. So yeah. <laughs> it wasn't that strategic a choice. <laughs> we did a webinar as women work last week on running virtual presentations. So talked a lot about your physical setup and a number of other things. So it was quite interesting um, to think through those details. Yeah. I guess depending on the audience, you gotta pick an appropriate spot. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> no, I have a friend in the media who's um, reporting from home and show me that backgrounds need to get approved and you have all, have all types of lighting and everything else. So That's they're very intense about it. I, I've seen some people with branding now. There was something I was watching yesterday mm -hmm. and they had like a screen up with their branding on it or like some kind of banner wall behind. Um, yeah. yeah. Ready so to I go tell live. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is good banter. <laughs> <laughs> I made yeah. a broke. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's going to become very popular moving on backgrounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see myself having a couple of them. Depending, yeah. <laughs> depending on which hat I have on in the time of the day, but, and my but, time on, that comes in automatically at 6 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> like, like those studios where you just move the screen and then you have a different <laughs> backdrop. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your background should match your outfit as well. You know, like you said, Chris should be appropriate for the time of day. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> I can see we are ramping up very fast. Oh yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, we give folks a few more minutes to join. So I says the designer said red, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I just happened to have that, have red headset and then many other red things. Yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, one of the things I talked about, it's feeling like ready, you prepared, you, you, mm. you're, the mood you're in, you know, kind of that, that preparation piece is quite important. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely needs a, a certain amount of energy to get into it. Yeah. All right. So, so, yeah. Shall we get started? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Great. We are at 50 participants and growing. Um, we're going to get started because we have a really packed agenda and I don't want to lose any of the juicy conversation that's going to be happening. So um, for those who are on, hello everyone and welcome to the webinar for better or for worse, the gendered impact of COVID-19 at home and at work. This webinar is hosted by Dahlberg and the Women Work Network. My name is Aika Matemu and I'm a director at Dalbuk Design and delighted to be the moderator for this webinar. We have a fantastic lineup of panelists who will share with us their diverse perspectives and experiences on working from home during this time of COVID-19. And the panelists will highlight differences in the world of work before and during COVID-19, share personal experiences of what they're currently going through while working from home, including the benefits as well as the challenges and best practices, and give us some advice on how to cope during this period. Um, and also give us an idea of how the world of work will shift post COVID-19 and what this new normal could potentially look like. So before introducing our panelists, I'd like to give a, a brief background on Dahlberg and the Women Work Network. Dahlberg is an impact-driven advisory firm working to build a more inclusive and sustainable world where all people everywhere can reach their fullest potential. We partner with and serve communities, governments, and companies providing an innovative mix of services such as advisory, investment, research, analytics, and design. Dahlberg has committed to applying a gender lens approach to all our work and diversity and inclusion is core to the firm's culture. We have made various efforts in promoting gender empowerment, 
within and outside the firm, we have also implemented a number of progressive initiatives to support our global staff, such as unconscious bias training and allyship training. We have globally reviewed parental policy and our leadership pays extra attention to both parents, including limiting travel for new parents. And through this webinar, we're hoping that this will be a platform that we can learn from others to continue making our working environment more inclusive, even under COVID, and also inspire other companies to build similar environments. And without further ado, I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, Isis Nyongo. Isis is a pioneer in the media and digital business industry in Africa. She is the founder of Mom's Village, a leading parenting and lifestyle platform in Kenya. And she makes a concerted effort to address gender bias in the workplace through woman work. Isis will give us a brief background of woman work. And I'm so happy to introduce you, Isis. Welcome. Thank you so much. And I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I, uh, I'm happy to give a bit of background on women work um, before we get started. And this is a network that I founded um, along with another woman professional and was really to address a lot of kind of structural biases in the workplace that both affect professionals as well as entrepreneurs. So we're kind of at an interesting time where a lot of you know, things are being upended in, in the world um, in, in the world of work. Um, but the network is over 3,000 members. Um, we are primarily operate as a closed Facebook group. So we're actually leave, like streaming live on Facebook right now to the group, which is quite exciting. Um, and it's a really dynamic community um, that really leverages the digital tools for support. And we really focus, spend a lot of time on skill development in different ways. So we've held probably over 30, 35 different um, learning sessions in person as well as webinars. Um, over the last um, year or so and um, have partnered with Dahlberg in the past. So we've done a great event with, with the gender team at Dahlberg, really happy to be doing this one. Um, and yeah, so really delighted to, to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isis. Um, and introducing our uh, second panelist, Chris Zananu, who is the Enterprise Managing Director of Telcom and the Chairman of BlackRock Capital Investments. Chris is an accomplished angel investor and business leader with over 20 years experience in strategic and transformational leadership across Africa. As the chair of BlackRock Capital, Chris has passionately helped to grow many tech businesses and mentored many tech entrepreneurs in Africa. Welcome, Chris. Well, thank you very much, Anika. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. As much as I feel like I got the token the, the token vote to be, <laughs> be the ladies. But um, yeah, um, I've always been passionate about uh, promoting the female agenda in the workplace, um, ensuring a number of women get onto C-suite and onto board specifically. And uh, I definitely have quite a number of uh, interesting views and opinions on how this COVID has impacted women, women in the workplace and also at home. So yeah, excited to be here to share uh, what I've observed and learned so far. Thank you, Chris. And our third panelist is Anne-Maria Makulo. Anne-Maria is the Chief of International Cooperation at AGRA, an alliance led by Africans with roots in farming communities across the continent. Anne's previous roles included the head of strategy and analytics, and she served as a key advisor to the president and chief of staff to help advance AGRA's mission and execute on several of AGRA's most critical priorities. Welcome, Anne-Maria. Thanks for that introduction. And I'm very excited to be participating on this call. I think, you know, there's a number of things why this topic is, a number of reasons why this topic is very close to my heart. Of course, personally, uh, just, you know, as a woman in the workplace, I'm looking to provide leadership. But then secondly, given the work that I do in the agriculture space, I'm working with women farmers as well as women owned SMEs um, and seeing the impact that COVID is having on them um, and being able to highlight that and possibly come up with solutions is something I'm excited about. I'm of course, happy to have the token male participant, Chris, um, as the daughter of a father who was very committed to the feminist cause and really encouraged me. I definitely see the importance of having men as part of the discussion. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Um, I have a feeling this is going to be very exciting. And before we get started, uh, a few housekeeping rules. Um, please use the Q&A box to post any questions that you have for the speakers. We will have a brief Q&A session at the end of the panel discussion. Um, and like Isis mentioned, uh, we are streaming, streaming live on Facebook, so please share the link broadly in your networks. Um, this webinar recording and slides will be shared after the meeting. And for those on social media, we have several hashtags that you can put out there. And uh, please embed any of these hashtags, gender, gender matters, gender lens, Dalberg on gender and COVID-19 um, in any of the social media channels that you're in. Great. So. Moving into our first topic, we will be discussing one minute. And this is a question that is going to ISIS. Um, how has the COVID-19 impacted the world of work? There are so many perspectives that are out there in terms of how working from home has impacted each of us as individuals. And there's a very famous uh, quote that has gone around, um, actually gone viral. And part of that quote says, you are not working from home, you are at your home during a crisis trying to work. And that's incredibly powerful. And so the first question goes over to ISIS. Has COVID-19 had a different impact on men than on women at work? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, that question. You know, I've been, um, you know, reflecting and, and trying to see what kind of data there is. And I think right now there's just not a lot of data that can, you know, um, really tell us exactly what's happening. But we do know that our world has been upended. Um, and a couple, I think the three things that that struck me as useful to share about this was first that the early indications, at least in Kenya, are that more of the job loss that's happened has, has impacted women. Um, women are higher represented in, in service industries. So whether some of those service industries have like gone sort of back to normal, sort of, not ish, um, not quite, um, that that's been, it can have a higher impact on, on women, both from job loss, I think impact on businesses for women led businesses. Uh, the indications are that those businesses have been hit harder, faster. Um, so that's one, you know, I think emerging gender difference that we're seeing. Um, also seeing that there is, is kind of exposing the digital divide um, in the country um, from a gender perspective. So um, women have less access to the devices and the connectivity than men do to kind of continue working from home from those whose jobs they can. Um, and so that's been kind of emerging area that um, will be interesting to see what, because there's some research also being done right now around um, the impact of COVID and what that research will show. And I think for me, the last thing is, you know, it's really hard to um, think about the change of work without it being linked directly to the change at home. And I think that the main difference um, that I'm seeing is, is really this question of like work productivity at home. And so the it's almost like whatever was happening at home has been amplified by COVID, right? So often women, you know, these are family, I'm talking about in the family structure where there's both um, a woman and, and a male partner with children that before COVID, a lot of the you know, operations and admin work was done by the women. Um, and that's just been exacerbated by now, you know, the children at home, so facilitating homeschooling, facilitating, maybe there's no longer house help in the house. So then also managing that. So that has a direct impact on your performance at work and your ability to show up and be productive. And one, I was um, a friend was sharing, and I think it's very true that the women have a lot more interruptions. So the amount of interruptions that come in through the day um, to her work are much, much higher than the male counterpart. Uh, so people kind of leave daddy alone to do his work. But, you know, for example, myself today, I was going, set up my son's Zoom call. I went to check on my daughter because they were at the same time. And she's like, oh, come join me, join me. And she was having like gym, gym Zoom. And she's like, you have to join me. And I, you know, so I did, it was actually really fun. But, you know, the time I was going to work, I was, you know, 
um, doing PE with her over Zoom. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing, but there are these kind of more breaks in concentration and ability to, to be productive. Um, and so the last thing I would say about that is there was an article, I think in the US that said that kind of 50% of men think they do more of the homeschooling work right now and only 3% of women agree. And so there is like this big disconnect between, and I love to get Chris's take on this, but men's perception of the work they're doing at home and the reality. Um, so I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Thanks for that, um, Isis. You have, you know, touched on many things, including uh, the shifting gender roles and gender dynamics in the household as a result of this, and um, just how time there is a lack of time for so many parents now because you are faced with this double responsibility of um, parenting, but also homeschooling as well. And how are people balancing and how are people coping and what are the trade-offs and how are employers even supporting this? And I, I wanna throw the next question to Anne Maria. Do you feel that employers are taking a gender lens as they respond to the impact of the pandemic? Okay, so um, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, and I'll explain why I'm saying that, right? I do think a lot of the, um, a lot of what has been put in place in terms of, you know, work from home, um, you know, virtual engagement, um, a, cert a certain measure of flexibility um, is definitely something which in many ways women are actually benefiting more from um, than men because they tend to have the burden of, of home care and the burden of child care, right? So to a certain extent that has been addressed, um, but I do think um, there's an additional burden on women, especially if you look at it from a mental health perspective um, and, and, and managing um, the burden, the COVID burden of managing the family in a time of crisis. Uh, but then also to the point that ISIS made around uh, loss of productivity, right? So there's some publications which are showing say for instance, in the research field, that women are 12% less productive than they were before because of those interruptions. And now given what's coming out, because you know the situation is also evolving, what additional steps can an employer take beyond the work from home and the virtual arrangements? You know, is there an opportunity for you know, certain increased flexibility, um, reduced work hours where it's possible um, and minimizing the cost from a upward, um, upward growth perspective, um, paid leave. Um, and even maybe even having additional days from a paid leave perspective. I know in the US, some of the states are considering giving employees um, potentially 12 weeks of paid leave, you know, on a case by case basis. I think we've not yet started having those conversations. We've had the more sort of general, you know, how do we protect the population at large? How do we minimize disruption? How do we enable virtual work? Uh, but I do think a more tailored response on what does this mean for women specifically um, in terms of productivity, in terms of the ability to deliver and what flexibility can an employer then bring in to accommodate that. Thanks, Anne-Maria, you've touched on a couple of things. Um, and just wanna highlight, you know, the common thread in what both you and ISIS are speaking about. And this is the growth trajectory. Because of, of decreased uh, performance and productivity, uh, what does this mean for both men and women, but uh, more so for women, what does this mean in terms of the career trajectory? And are employees cons em employers considering this in terms of looking at performance reviews um, during this time of COVID? And also realizing that not everybody has the luxury of working from home. So not all jobs allow you to be sitting at home and working from a laptop. And so all of this can create some sort of strain and, and constraint on an individual. And, and this is where the mental health um, point has come up and, and the point around um, ensuring that people are taking care of themselves and people are able to um, plan their lives in a way that is actually realistic. And so our next subtopic is how COVID-19 has changed the dynamics at home. And there's a quote here from Michelle Obama that I want to share that says, women are working more, men are understanding their value as caregivers, women are primary breadwinners. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Things are different. So we can't keep operating like everything is the same. 
And that's why many of us have done for a long time. And I think it's up to us to change the conversation. And that's you know, really thought provoking, particularly at this time. COVID-19 has had unintended consequences on our daily dynamics at home. And, and the, this question is for you, Chris. Um, how has COVID changed the gender dynamics at home from your perspective? And what impact has that had for you and other men in your network? Thanks, Alika. Um, I think first, let me start by saying a lot of men have begun to appreciate what it means really genuinely to be a woman, what it means to run a home, what it means um, to do what used to be homework, but now has become full schoolwork, you know, eight, eight to two or eight to five, depending on which level your kids are at. So I think there's a greater appreciation for men that um, this the position or the portfolio of director of home affairs is a hefty one and should be paid um, and should be given the attention and acknowledgement that is due to it. So that's the first bit of it. This, the second thing I'd say is um, I got a quote last week, which or was a joke, which says, do, do I work at home or do I live at work? Because obviously this whole new normal is getting people confused. Um, typically I say, once I come downstairs from my bedroom, I'm at work. And once I go upstairs, I'm home. That's the delineation I've, I've, I've been able to put in my mind. And this is simply because um, we're using the same space for work and home. And so that interface, what used to be an annoyance, which was traffic, going, commute, commuting um, from home to work or work to home, also used to serve as a break. That space, that gap, that makes you or allows you to shift your mentality. But coming back to the male um, agenda, um, I, I think the roles or the dynamism in the, the homes have changed. Um, I think women are obviously more bold to ask the men to chip in on time and effort. And I think there's a lot of men like myself who are actually enjoying being home and getting more engaged in the kids' education, getting more engaged in the meal plan for the family um, and being able to plug in more valuably to the family life. So that, that, if I were to give you some stats, because I did a, a little poll before this um, webinar because I wanted to know from my friends what they felt. So I took 20 friends and I asked a couple of questions. And one of the questions was, do you feel like you're more, what is the main change that you've had? That was the question number one. And they're like, look, getting to spend more time with the kids is refreshing. Um, and I'm getting less nagging from the partner. And when you dig, dig, dig deeper into the less nagging, it's simply because the question of where you, where did you pass after work? is become, well, because of quarantine, it's been eliminated. Because um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which side of the table you sit, uh, most women have a 360 degree bed eyes view of where their partners are. And so that particular friction has been eliminated. But I also think that that friction being eliminated has given an opportunity for uh, people to engage, partners to engage on more strategic stuff for the family. Um, it's been two months and a lot of conversations, which I think the men in particular, which was the second uh, answer I got that most of them have been forced to have discussions that they've been shelving or shelving or sweeping under the carpet for the last five years, because there's no way you can go, you're stuck. So you have to have those conversations. So they've been tough conversations that have happened. I believe that also men have realized that the disparity between men and women in the workplace has become even worse with this working from home because of the extra load of specifically taking care of the kids. Um, but then that, it's also opened an opportunity, which is um, what Anne was talking about that employers are gonna have to or have begun to have conversations about, well, we can reduce rent, we can give more flexi time and the whole traditional thinking around maternity, the leave days can be reformatted. So if you ask me, I think the real next steps for women to gain from this COVID or work at home scenario is a little bit of policy change and a lot of 
mentality change or paradigm shift from the male counterparts who are typically um, signing off these things from the board level. That, that's, that's where we are. Thank you, Chris. Um, you, you've thrown some a lot of nuggets of wisdom in there. <laughs> my, my favorite one is men appreciate what it means to be a woman. That's a, a very loaded statement and, and happy that you threw it out there. Uh, but, you know, just wanted to highlight about, you know, something that you said around uh, more active engagement in strategic family matters. And I think that's that's really interesting because um, I, I remember at the beginning of this pandemic, you know, people were saying, you know, you're either going to survive your relationship or you're not going to survive your relationship. And, you know, that's, of course, you know, grounded on very many things, you know, how strong is the foundation of your relationship and so on. Um, so that's a very positive reflection that you've shared, Chris, and, and really excited to hear. And I'm happy you did a poll of your friends. I hope they're listening to this webinar now. Um, but what, wanted to shift gears a little bit um, and, and discuss how COVID has impacted our social lives. Um, you know, Chris, you mentioned something about uh, our partners always curious about where we are at any given time. Uh, but for many of us, being restricted to our homes has been really challenging. It's, it's affected um, our relationships with people outside of our families. And it, it's really forced us to think of other ways of socializing. And so my next question is to Anna Maria. Um, COVID has impacted the way we traditionally meet with friends and family. How are people adapting and what impact is this having on mental well-being? Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think, and before I talk about friends and family, there's the impact on dating life, right? Uh, for very many single people who may have started the year with goals about, you know, meeting somebody and etc. Um, of course, with the social distancing, you know, now you're relying more on, you know, your apps and your, you know, your virtual online dating, uh, but then even meeting uh, then becomes a challenge. So I think that's a conversation for another day, but I think there's been a huge impact there. Uh, but if I just look at um, the more sort of um, dynamics around friends and family, I um, mean, maybe I'll just pick an example from my own life. Um, I remember when COVID st started, I come from a very close knit family. Um, and my brother actually sent us a message and said, um, I am neither receiving visitors nor are we leaving our house, right? And therefore, that meant that any meetings that we would have would, would therefore need to be virtual. So, I mean, I think definitely you're seeing more of, you know, virtual. Um, teleconferences. I, I just had a virtual book club on Sunday um, with, with, a, with a group of friends. Um, and I think right now, you know, because right now in Kenya, we've been in this situation since March. In the beginning, of course, we were a lot more careful around, you know, social distancing and staying in the house. Um, I think over time, people started coming up with, you know, a small group of friends they can hang out with where we have similar sets of um, rules we've set up for ourselves and feel safe to hang out with each other. So I'm seeing some of that happening, whether it's advisable or not. I mean, that's that's a discussion, right? Because you don't always have control over who has seen um, and who has seen who. Um, and I think one of the things which is maybe a little bit more alarming over the last couple of uh, weeks, the last week or so, is that many social spaces are just almost reverting to normal. Um, and you know, in this context where we're saying the peak could happen in September or August, thereabouts in Africa, what could that mean? Uh, but you're also balancing, you know, the health considerations versus the economic and the social and the impact on, um, on, on mental well-being for people. Because I think social distancing for a lot of people, um, I mean, we talk about, you know, the impact on productivity for um, parents who have children at home, uh, but also for single people, um, there is a significant impact of, you know, spending time primarily in your home where, you know, essentially you're, is, I don't know how Chris put it, you're living at work. But not only are you living at work, you're living alone at work. Um, and, and, and therefore the impacts from a mental health perspective are significant. Um, there's a study that was carried out in the US um, comparing the impact on mental health for men versus women. And they found that there was a 66% increase in the gap in mental health between men and women. So in the study they did, the impacts on mental health for men were negligible, uh, but for women it was significant and widened the gap by 66%. 
But I think what I found more interesting is that, you know, you'd expect the usual things of, you know, increased childcare, you know, productivity, work from home burnout to be the reasons for this, um, for this increased gap. But what they found was that controlling for childcare are controlling for loss of jobs, controlling for work from home burnout, the impact of women was still more. So even women who were single and didn't have children and hadn't experienced job loss were still significantly more affected mentally than men. Um, and I, I think right now, you know, the jury is out on why. Why is that the case? I don't know, it might be something to do with the anxiety. Um, it might be something to do with, you know, other factors as well. And I think it's just something um, you know, what's continuing to explore and, and, and to figure out how do we support women in that context. Thank you very much, um, Amaria. Um, and, and thank you for bringing up the point around socializing. I think as Kenyans, we, we have it in our genes. We love to socialize and we love to be out there. So, you know, this is a particularly challenging time, you know, for many of us who, um, uh, routinely socialize with people. Um, but on the point of uh, single people or people living alone, um, I think there's, there, there's something to be said there because um, it can be anything from personality because you know introverts and extroverts are experiencing this pandemic in different ways. Um, extroverts are, are missing that you know social connection and, and being around people and introverts just further recede into you know their introversion and you know that can particularly be be dangerous and so how do we think about uh, strategies to support people in general um, whether you have families or whether you're single and so this brings us to um an, an, an interesting can and I, can, I, can i quickly comment about two things one you know sometimes yes. when we talk about people um um Single, single parenting, we look at it purely from the female perspective. There's a lot of single parents, I mean, male single parents, and um, the impact also over there is very, is, is very different. And so I just wanted to say, sometimes we should also look at the, the, this impact of um, COVID, staying at home. If you're a single parent and you're male, and now the education bit comes on it, and, most often than not, men are not that patient and they feel like um, that's a low blow to them. Um, two out of the 20 of the people that I surveyed were in that category where they were single, they were single men, but they had a kid with them. And um, the second point I wanted to do was on the social. Um, one of the things we're going to see coming up is a lot more dating apps um, because of the social distancing. You're going to see more matchmaking uh, using digital platforms. And um, I think I wanted to comment also and say, I have quite a lot of friends in India and South Africa and the, and the big difference between what we went through or what we're going through in Kenya and those two was alcohol was not being sold in India and South Africa. And so it made the quarantine even less bearable if I can put it that way. So we need to thank our president for allowing people to be able to access alcohol. I don't know why, but it has been one of, it's one of the things that I got feedback like, look here, so far as I got a bottle of wine at the end of the day, after working hard and having to um, play hard also with the kids, then that made a big difference. And I think also there might be a gender difference to that thought process of alcohol. And maybe that's the reason why the men are not too frustrated to be in the home space um, as opposed to out in the pubs. Can I, sorry, can I just jump in right there? Um, I, I think one of the challenges though, the flip side of that, Chris, is, and, and I, I think for South Africa, I'm not 100% sure, but I think decisions were made about that because of gender-based violence um, and the link between alcohol um, and that behavior. So, and, you know, so anyway, I, I think we could, we could certainly talk more about GBV in our own countries. So, uh, but yeah, there, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Um, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Isis. Um, I, I think there's a lot to unpack in there. Um, and I, I can actually just throw the next question to you. So since the outbreak, um, domestic violence cases have been on the rise globally. Mm -hmm. How can we respond to in increased instances of gender-based violence and support survivors post-lockdown? 
Sure. Um, you know what? Yeah, unfortunately, you're, you're right. Um, you, we do see headlines from around the world. So it is a global issue. Um, and in Kenya, I think that the, the rates of kind of reported cases of GBB, um, even kind of one month into COVID, were, had risen by 30%. So it's a very real challenge um, and it's being exacerbated by the, the closeness of that proximity of living and, and the ability to uh, people who are not in safe homes um, and the curfew and the restricted movement is like exacerbating the, the challenge. I think we are quite fortunate that, um, that the, um, the government is actually been doing quite a lot um, in terms of the gender ministry and the civil society organizations uh, in Kenya had been very, very quick to look at, you know, how can these issues be addressed and ensure that the, there is both, I mean, the one thing they're, they're doing research on um, that's ongoing right now to kind of better understand the gender differences and the impact of COVID, including this. Um, but I think many of you would have heard of the, the hotline. Um, and if you haven't, that's something, I think it's 1194, the government hotline, and that's something everybody should be aware of. Um, and can use an individual basis if you need help or if you know people who need help because they've really beefed up the, um, the, the staffing of the hotline um, and expanding uh, together with development partners that uh, expanded kind of what you can do. So, so you can both get counseling, um, you can get referrals to safe houses. Um, the safe houses have also been, um, you know, I think we certainly don't have enough of them. Um, and, you know, but, the, but they are there and the social distancing means that they can't be used to the capacity that they could before. But I think it's quite important that people are aware that those services you know, are there. Um, and there's other things that I think as individuals you can do. I mean, the company Moms Village that I, that I run, we, we actually have um, online safe spaces. So closed WhatsApp groups um, for women who are survivors, um, who we're seeing increasing number of people join them um and have counselors to support them so there's kind of like both digital options there's physical safe houses so there's actually quite a bit that's that's happening in response to this and i think from a policy and um level and, and prevention is really kind of um also on the undercurrent but really trying to address the the more immediate um needs around this Um, thanks, Isis. Uh, definitely um, an area that needs to be unpacked a lot. Um, and, and just, you know, a follow on question in terms of what a post COVID world will look like um, from the perspective of some of these individuals who are experienced gender based violence and potentially other people in their household, such as children who are also experiencing this violence. Um, what sort of uh, support do you see there being moving forward? You know, I, I think that there will be, and I've already seen a number of, it's interesting, new apps. I've actually seen a number of apps around uh, both to support people from a mental health perspective um, that I think will, will go, will be, you know, very helpful. I think that um, when people, I think it's also looking at, you know, right, right now during the current restriction, people can't move between counties where they might have been able to move someplace else for to be safe. That's not a safe house. Maybe their 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 parents' home or something. So I, I think that when you know restricted movement is lifted, there'll be more options. Um, and and hopefully and hopefully from some of the focus from um, or, or I would say that some of the services provided by the government in terms of what they call the duty bearers, the people in the front line. Let's say the police officers, the the people who kind of receive a lot of this information firsthand. Um, that they're much better equipped to handle this. So I think that that will be one of, hopefully one of the um, longer term positive impacts of this because of the, the increased you know, resources going into the training service right now. Yeah. So Aika, I just wanted to chip in and say, one of the biggest impacts of COVID is gonna be job losses. I think we're gonna see a lot of people out of work in July, August in quarter three. And if you look at the construct, a lot of SMEs, um, almost 55% are run by women or women owned, women run. But on the flip side, on the low collar, the blue collar jobs, there's a lot of men there. And when men lose income, they lose status in their minds and in reality in their homes. And there's definitely a lot of correlation between gender violence and loss of jobs or loss of status or, or, or income. 
And so that's something that we as a country are gonna have to be looking out for to say, what, what can we do or how do we start preparing these families where maybe the lady had a SME, she was running, the man had a blue collar job and one or both of them have lost their source of income. And how is that gonna impact um, gender violence in, 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 the, in the homes? Especially because um, they are now, if one of them is still working, they are probably or potentially going to be working from home. And so the other partner who's lost their uh, way, livelihood is now seated there permanently staring at them or engaging them. Yes, that's, this is absolutely true, Chris. And, and we see that at all levels of society, um, you know, whether you're talking about informal settlements or you're talking about, you know, large urban centers, you know, this is a phenomenon that is happening across the board. So hearing that there are initiatives in, in place to support these individuals and, and these survivors is, you know, really, really encouraging and uh, hopeful for us. And so going into our, Last subtopic, and this is on the topic of post-COVID. What does this mean for post-COVID world? And there's a quote here from Sarah Pantiolino. We won't get back to normal because normal was the problem. And there is such heated discussion about, you know, why normal was the problem. And I think there, the debate can go on and on and on and on and on. But uh, Chris, this, this question is for you. Is there an opportunity to galvanize on shifting dynamics around gender norms and translate it into more gender inclusive work policies? Um, exact, ex example, equal paternity leave, family days for men to take a sick child to hospital, flexible work environments, and um, also involved in caregiving as the woman. And I, I think you had already started touching on, on some of these. But you know, within the context of um, Kenya and, and East Africa, you know, do you see this shift happening progressively or is it already happening or is it going to take a lot more for um, organizations to, to pivot? And um, also on that same point, you know, just looking at it from more of a business perspective, uh, there's several businesses that have said, oh, we realize that we can work remotely. So do we even need offices? Do we need physical spaces? You know, some are even saying, do we need schools? But I think that's stretching it. But um, what are your perspectives on the post-COVID? Aika, um, look, I 100% agree or I'm just, what was normal, what we had before, genuinely is something that's been there and we've, we, we kind of pieced it together for years. COVID gives every person, every function department, every company, every industry, an opportunity to take three steps back and reevaluate whether the way we did stuff even made sense then and how we can do it different now moving forward. So I'm a big believer that as opposed to trying to create the future post COVID from the past, which is what we're calling normal. And so we're saying the new normal, we should just look at the future and say, how do we make this make sense to us? So that's my, my, my first pointer. My second pointer is 75% odd of the HR profession is made up of women not men. In fact, I think in the last IHRM poll locally in Kenya, I think we're even up to about 82% because a lot of men go into HR and then move out into operations or something. So what I believe is that um, from a policy perspective, from a change of how do we do what we do perspective, there is a very big chance or opportunity for women who are in the culture, um, strategy, HR um, vertical to use this COVID opportunity to make strategic changes for the organizations. Now let's come to what changes those are. It begins with rebalancing. When we begin to hire again, rebalancing the female versus male content of the companies, why? because a lot of jobs are going to be reclassified 
that you can do them permanently from home. And I think that's a big opportunity for a lot of women who may not have wanted fixed location-based jobs to go for positions that they would not traditionally go for, but now they can because they are permanent, you can work from home or highly flexible hours, uh, working hours for them. I also believe that um, the gender bias towards certain positions will also, has already begun to change in the background, but I think we need more champions to push it out there, to push the agenda out there. And we need more forum and platform to discuss these changes. I do believe the issue of paternity leave is going to become very pertinent. Um, if my partner agrees and uh, agrees that we can have another kid, believe me, I'm gonna be looking at the one taking more paternity leave because I, I feel that in my first two kids, I missed out on a, a couple of very exciting things that I could have done as a father. Just because it's not a traditional role, I thought, well, I only have a two week window and most cases, your employer expects you in the office for a half day, not really like you're off off. So I think there's a lot of things happening. I think there's a lot of discussions that need to be held, but I feel very positive that if people stop talking about new normal, but start thinking, let's reshape the future. I think we're gonna be able to come up with compromises that work for all family structures, single men who are parents, single women who are parents and traditional couples where there's a male, female and they both work or one works and doesn't. And so that, that's the opportunity I see. Thanks, Chris. Um, you ended there on a very utopic tone um, and, and really encouraging. Um, I just want to hear from, from the rest of the panelists on that same point. Um, so, you know, like we are saying, we had a certain normal before the pandemic, uh, but things have changed. What should we stop doing? What should we start doing? And what can we improve upon? And um, I'll, I'll ask Anne Maria if you can respond to that really quickly um, in terms of your thoughts around that. Okay, yeah. Um, I think just picking up from what Chris has said, I, I do think, um, and, and then I'll still use the language of the new normal um, around flexibility at the workplace, because the disruption is not just in the workplace, but the disruption, the disruption is also the future of learning and schools, uh, but then also some societal shifts about how do we think about the roles of the different genders in the home um, and in the workplace as well. So I think one of the things which we'll, we'll stop doing, I think a lot of the rigidity around gendered roles um, in the home, a lot of the rigidity around, you know, what does productivity look like? You know, I expect to see you physically in the office doing X or working a certain number of hours and the hours are between eight and four um, or eight and five, for instance. Um, I think increasingly there'll be no place for that, right? Um, especially as we have people moving virtually. So that's one of the things that we need to stop doing. So that extremely gendered roles, but then also, um, the rigidity around the workplace and how we think about productivity and how and, and, and how we therefore support support our employees. Um, what we need to start doing or continue doing more of is if, if you think about like this work from home arrangements, you know, you're, you're seeing some companies in the US already looking into the future and saying what this means for them, right? Amazon, Google, etc. I haven't seen a similar response saying can companies back home on saying, you know, long term, if we project this out, what could this mean? And I think it's something we need to start doing and saying, you know, what's the future of the workplace? Um, do we need to have, you know, one of the things we're discussing where I work is do we need to all start hot desking? Um, where, you know, you actually don't have a permanent place you sit because you have a rotational kind of arrangement. Um, and, you know, what's the flexibility in terms of work hours, um, in terms of, you know, engagement uh, modalities, et cetera. Um, I think what we need to improve, I do think, um, and coming back to the earlier discussion, um, even as we're putting in place these measures, which affect both men and women, to be honest, uh, we do need to take a more gendered lens um, I mean, some of the things we've talked about earlier here around, you know, productivity, around the fact that, you know, men are four times more likely to be supported by their partner at home compared to women. Um, I think employers um, need to start factoring that in and maybe to the point Chris was making around if it's looking at the HR function um, and saying, you know, how do we even get more innovative about how we think about performance management? Should we go the traditional route that we've taken 
all along? Um, do we need to have more innovative approaches around that? Um, and how do we then design for that? So yeah, definitely opportunities to do that. Thanks, Anna Maria. Um, one thing that I haven't heard coming up in this discussion is travel. Um, a commute has come up, but you know, travel for work has not been something that has come up. So interesting to hear your perspective, Isis. Um, you know, the same question: What should we stop doing? What should we sure. start? How can we improve? And what about travel? Yeah, sure. I mean, I I love the utopian future that Chris has portrayed. Um, I mean, I think particularly interesting to think about. Um, the opportunity for women to actually participate in different types of roles that they would not have. And this goes to travel, actually. I know a lot of people, uh, myself included in the past, who have turned on a number of things because of travel. Um, and so when you take that out of the equation and you know have deliberately kind of cut off the careers in different ways because of that, I think that that will be very, very interesting to see that, that shift. Um, I also think that one of, the, one of the things about working from home and whether I've seen and been part of conversations where employers are talking about, oh, you know, don't worry, we have um, we have tools to make sure people are working at home. Like we have different, like whether it's like software that's measuring productivity or, um, which I find quite interesting. I think particularly because I'm, I've always worked in kind of the tech space where there's been quite a lot of autonomy working from home before, but that there is this assumption that if you're at the office, you're being productive. <laughs> like, I mean, because it, it struck me that these, these tools had not been used before, right? To, to understand productivity at the office. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting and telling and it may, maybe it's just like this, um, this discomfort right now with what's really going on at home with people if I can't see them, you know? Um, and, and so, but maybe there'll be ways that those kind of better things that people don't feel like they're being spied on but it's more kind of output, output focused. Um, I think that Two other things that struck me, and one thing that Chris has said that I think is a really great opportunity now is really from the HR perspective and really looking at what are the opportunities to change a lot, but particularly around unpaid care. Uh, because I don't think pre-COVID that the unpaired care issue in Kenya was going to be addressed anytime soon. Um, and I think that this is a unique opportunity where most of the decision makers um, around this, you know, policy, we're talking about national level, really are the ones who, who are decision makers around do you, how do you look at unpaid care? And by unpaid care, I mean working, the work that women have traditionally been doing um, of taking care of, of, you know, working in the home that is time that is not, um, that is not kind of calculated to GDP. It's not uh, compensated for in any kind of monetary way. Um, so I think that's very interesting. And the last thing I think I, I would say about this um, in terms of what we should continue doing is, um, is I think this is become more of an opportunity for men to have a more integrated role, I mean, a, a more integrated life um, between work and home and that, you know, employers will value that more. So for example, I was talking to someone yesterday who's um, doing some work for me and, you know, he said, you know, by the way, I just had a baby two weeks ago. I don't think I'll be able to get this done tomorrow. Give me a couple more days. But I think those kind of conversations would not have been had before. Like he would never mention he had a baby. He would never, you know, that he was up, you know, helping take care of an infant, um, but that he felt comfortable to talk about that. And those are conversations you typically have with women. So I think that is a great, a really great change that, that COVID has presented to us um, so, that, so that people can live more holistically. Yeah. I mean, ISIS, just to jump on quickly, 100%. So I, I I believe that a lot of men want to, or would have wanted to plug in to the family life, but just didn't have the opportunity because of this mentality that to be seen, to be working is to be seen to be in the office. And once we are able to make that paradigm shift, first from the employee level, and secondly, from the employer level, I think you're gonna to begin to see a lot more partnership on the home front in terms of taking care of the Department of Home Affairs. I think a lot of men want to plug in. It's just that they didn't have opportunities. And so this is, this is giving the men the opportunity to show that they can actually add value. And also, like I said right from the beginning, a greater appreciation of what it means to be a woman and to run a home, especially when you're working or you run a business. Thank you. Um, what a great way to summarize this uh, discussion. 
Um, I, I did uh, have one more point, but I realized that we're running out of time. Um, but I just wanted to mention that um, what you mentioned, Isis, on unpaid care, I think is, is really, really critical. And um, it, it, it would be really interesting to hear from all of those people who were previously, you know, working from home moms and, and caregivers and now shifting to this um, uh, COVID pandemic. And what, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, because uh, I, I am not a stay at home mom, but I do have several of friends who are and family. And it is a full time job in the Department of Home Affairs, as you say, Chris. Um, and be, you know, you kind of work your own schedule, but, you know, now being in the home and, you know, your partner is home as well and, and the kids are always home and, you know, now you've also become a teacher, um, it really, you know, creates an, an added burden to this. Um, and also, what is the role of support groups during this time? Um, social support groups, community support groups and family support groups, um, they are quite essential in, I think, being able, you know, Chris, when you said when you go from upstairs to downstairs, um, I feel like, you know, a support system allows you to come out from, you know, your home environment to another environment of people who can support and speak to you. And I think it's, it's, it's really critical. I really value my, my support groups for that reason. We have five minutes left and there are questions that have come in. So we are going to see if we can tackle at least two questions. The first one, and I'm just gonna throw this out to um, the panelists so anyone can answer. The question is, there will continue to be job losses due to COVID. Do you think this will have a gender impact and how can we prepare for this? And I think this was touched a little bit upon earlier, but i um, happy for anyone to take this on. Go ahead, Isis. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Can you can you can you repeat it one more time? I was I was scanning the questions um, in the chat. No worries. So the question is: there will be, there will continue to be job losses due to COVID. Mm -hmm. Do you think this will have a gender impact, and how can we prepare for this? Yes, I mean I think the early indications is that there already has been increased loss from um, that impact impacted women more than men. Um, but I think the hard data will be available um, later in June, um, the research that UN Women and Gender Ministry are working on. Um, so I think that the, the ways to kind of address that certainly are, um, and I think a number of financial institutions are, um, are trying to address this already, is, is there different types of funding that, uh, at least for the entrepreneur side, that can keep women-led SMEs afloat, um, whether it's grant funding or or uh, loans that um, you know can be you know have long kind of just just different you know um, requirements to them to enable that. So I think I think there's a lot of there seems to be quite a lot of effort on that side on the SME side. I think in terms of the direct job loss if you're employed, um, you know I think that what I'm not sure how much more is being done around um, what to do to um, to address that. But I think having the the data around this in terms of ensuring that it's understood uh, the gender difference between the job loss is quite important to then be able to make um, policy changes um, around that for whatever the, you know, the government and et cetera can, can do to, to address it. Yeah. yeah, and maybe let me just contribute to that, Aika. Um, I mean, you know, so two things, I mean, given that the sectors which I mean, the disruptions will be felt across various sectors, but the sectors which have been identified as hardest hits in terms of like tourism, hospitality, et cetera, have a disproportionate share of women. Um, of course, the government, various governments are in discussion on how do they, how, how, do the, how does the government put in place either social protection programs um, or some kind of you know, recovery or post recovery fund that supports people within those sectors. I think those would be extremely important, right? So the role of government in providing that social protection can't be understated. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, like on the agriculture space specifically, like some of the things we're looking at as an organization is how do you reduce 
um, income loss. So not just job, not just maintaining a job, but if you talk about farmers, for instance, uh, they're not relying on a job, but you do want to protect that income. Um, and that's a combination of both working with the government, uh, but then also um, the subsidies you offer for access to inputs and access to markets. So there are various things, uh, various programs being run by different organizations and in, up to and including also the SME recovery funds as well. My, my only comment on that is really, we all have to be conscious and um, deliberate in how we're going to deal with the mental health issues which are gonna come from the job losses. Um, you find that in the case where the finances of the home are managed by the woman and she's fully aware what comes in what the loss is going to be on the side of the man. Um, typically, this the, the financial management has catered for some amount of savings and buffer, probably three to six months. Where the financial management of the home is dealt with by the man, then the probability that there is no buffer is higher. And so we're going to be having quite a lot of uh, mental health issues that have to be taken care of. And so, um, because the, the impact um, on the family could be the same, but the mental health impact on, on, on the males are typically um, higher and can lead to uh, devastating effects. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I feel like you opened a small can of worms there, but we are um, at time. I just want to appreciate the panelists uh, for participating and, and really bringing yourself uh, into this conversation. Thank you so much. And uh, from Dahlberg and Women Works, we appreciate everyone who attended. It has been a great attendance. We're sorry we did not answer all your questions, uh, but we hope to have a follow uh, follow up webinar on the same topic. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.